introduction to hardware hacking. Uh, earlier today, uh, Joe Grand gave a great talk about some advanced topics. But I'm going to step back a little bit and talk about sort of some introductory skills and introduction to uh, hardware hacking if you want to want to start in on it. So why hardware hacking? For me, anyway. Um, hardware hacking doesn't seem to get near the publicity as uh, much publicity as uh, computer or software hacking. I'd like to change that. Uh, I'd like to make hacking a more positive thing, get more people introduced to it and more people doing it. So I always sort of start off with a definition. What is a hardware hack? And this is a little bit uh, long, but bear with me. To me, a hardware hack is a sometimes clever modification or fix made to a piece of equipment that improves its performance or makes the equipment do something for which it was not originally intended. The results of the hack need not be useful in the strict sense of the word. They can just be fun. Um, you can use the word hack as a noun or a verb. You know, as a noun, you can say, well, that hack you made to your toaster was great. Or as a verb, you can say, let's hack your brother's TV set tonight so it can only tune to channel 13. <laughs> well, for me, hardware hacking has always been easier. Well, why is that? Well, when you buy a piece of hardware, let's say a toaster, for example, you can open it up and you can see exactly what's inside. You know, there's nothing obscured inside of it. Uh, very often, repair manuals are available for most uh, equipment. Um, and your girlfriend's significant other can benefit from your skills as a hacker. You can fix stuff around the house. Um, you know, when's the last time uh, your girlfriend or significant other asked you to fix their copy of Word? Pro okay. <laughs> so software skills are useful too, but for me, you can fix electrical stuff. When you buy a piece of commercial software, you can't open it up and see how it works. Now, of course, the uh, exception to this is open source, and open source is a great thing. Um, but with most pieces of software, you're stuck with an executable file and no source code. You can't see how it works or change it. Its behavior is fixed, usually, and, you know, to which uh, things the original programmer intended it to do. You can't examine it and change it. Um, again, open source is sort of an example to, is an exception to this and is a very good thing. A little bit about me. I graduated uh, too many years ago from MIT with a couple of degrees. Um, I've been hacking since I was a kid. When I was probably eight years old, my father bought me one of those 101 electronics kits from uh, Radio Shack. You know, it said ages 13 and above, but he didn't bother reading the uh, uh, recommended ages. So I just sort of put stuff together. You know, at first, most of it didn't work. But uh, as I got into it, I got more and more of the little circuits to work um, and uh, just enjoyed that. I also enjoyed taking apart stuff around the house, old radios, toasters, stuff like that. Um, I felt a bunch of different day jobs. I've been a toy designer uh, many years ago. Uh, I've designed digital cameras for Apple. I started a company a number of years ago called Pocket Science, and, and I'm a writer of the hardware hacking book, of which it uh, is an example here. Um, took me about two years to write, and in it I gather a number of hacks that uh, I did and some other stuff I thought was cool and, and uh, put it together. Okay, in this talk we're going to cover a number of items. We're going to talk about some basic electrical engineering concepts. Uh, we're going to talk about some basic components, electronic components you'll see, uh, and what they do. We'll talk about uh, cracking the case, how to open up electronics without really destroying it. Many times you want the piece of equipment to be cosmetically clean when you're done, either for your own purposes or for purposes of, of not having it uh, uh, seen as being opened up. We'll talk a little bit about building circuits, um, how to read a schematic diagram, how to breadboard, which is a way to quickly prototype circuits without picking up a soldering iron. And then we'll talk a little bit about soldering irons, how to solder stuff together, how to connect up different uh, integrated circuits. We'll talk a little bit about where to get parts, some places online and some places offline. And then we'll walk through a couple projects, uh, stuff that I've worked on. I'll describe some of the parts and some of the motivations behind it. Uh, both some small scale stuff. I've got a, a toaster I hacked up. Uh, I hacked up a, a, a self-cooling beer mug and an electronic uh, flashlight where I've taken an incandescent flashlight and did a quick hack and changed it to use LEDs. And finally, I'll walk through a, a semi-famous hack by a group called the Chaos Computer Cub over in Germany called Blinken Lights, where they took a eight-story building and turned it into a giant display. So I'll talk about a few of the technical details behind that. Okay, there's sort of two basic classes of components that, uh, that you can use when you build circuits, it's called passive and active. Passive parts are just that. They don't do anything active to a signal or do anything active to electricity, and they're sort of Four that I'll call out right now that you can, uh, we can talk about. Resistors, capacitors, inductors, and transformers, which are actually a type of uh, inductor. And then there's active parts, and that's sort of the pretty much everything else, and which is uh, transistors, diodes, and integrated circuits, which are basically just a bunch of transistors. Okay, resistors. What does a resistor do? It limits or resists the flow of electricity. Uh, a lot of times people like to think about the, the water pipe analogy when you think about electronics. 
Well, uh, if you think about a pipe as a piece of wire with water flowing through it, a resistor would be a difference in diameter of that pipe that would either resist or allow more water to flow through it. Resistor values are measured in ohms. Um, the equation that governs the flow of electricity through a resistor is V equals IR, where V is the voltage, I is the current, and resistance is measured uh, is, is R. An example of how a resistor is used, a simple example, is that you can use it to limit current through a light emitting diode or LED. <coughs> LEDs are, uh, you can't just hook them to a battery and let them light up. You need to resist or limit the flow of current through them. If you don't limit this flow, the LED will typically blow up. So that's what you use a resistor for. And what you do is you typically hook it in series, and I'll cover this in another slide. Um, resistors themselves, let me get a pointer here, come in lots of different packages. These are um, through hole components. These are probably, you know, maybe five, six millimeters long. They've got little metal leads coming out. And this other one over here is a surface mount part. It's a little tiny chip, um, and they're getting smaller every day. Uh, Joe, in an earlier talk, mentioned that uh, resistors are getting so small that you can actually inhale them and not know. They're actually getting that small. The schematic symbol for a resistor here is a line with a bunch of squiggly things, uh, and we'll get into schematics in a little bit. But next to every component in a schematic diagram, there's typically what's called a reference designator. That's that letter R, standing for resistor, uh, and a number telling you which resistor, and then a value. Right here it says resistor, which is a, a default for a schematic capture package I use. Capacitors. Capacitors store energy in the form of an electric field. Um, they act basically like small batteries in a circuit. Um, the value of a capacitor is measured in Faraday, farads, which is uh, named after Michael Faraday. Uh, voltage, current, and capacitance follow a slightly different equation. You'll probably have to dig out your calculus books and, and uh, your old math books to, to really work with this equation. But basically, the current that flows through a resistor is equal to the capacitance, the capacitive value, times the change in voltage with respect to time. So basically what this means is if you put a, a slowly increasing voltage across a capacitor, uh, you can get current to flow through it. But if you put a constant voltage, uh, just like if you touch a battery to the terminals, current will flow for, through, for, through it for a short amount of time, and then it will charge up like a battery. Uh, capacitors are sometimes polarized. And what this means is that it has a plus side and a minus side. And if you hook it up backwards, it will pop. It will actually explode. So you need to look at the, the capacitor you're using. Typically, they have a little plus marked on one side. Um, capacitors are often used to, to filter uh, noisy circuits. Uh, most capacitors are used in power supplies. Uh, when, you get to, when you convert uh, power in a battery to uh, use from a laptop or power from the wall current, uh, used to usually uh, filter it. Okay, so I'll get the pointer up here. So capacitors come in lots of different packages. This can here is a type of capacitor called an electrolytic capacitor. Uh, electrolytic basically refers to the chemistry used to build it. Uh, electrolytic capacitors are almost always polarized. This capacitor over to the left of it, this little yellow blob, is called a tantalum capacitor. Um, they use a small dot of a metal called tantalum placed onto a, a edge of a, one of the metal pins inside of it, and it actually stores quite a bit of energy for a small package, and then they encapsulate it. Tantalums are almost always uh, polarized, and if you do run a tantalum cap capacitor backwards, you'll get a nice little bang on the board. So if you want to have an exploding circuit, you can put the capacitors in backwards and watch the fireworks. Um, capacitors also come in little tiny chip scale packages. Let me get the pointer here again, which is over here. These are called surface mount capacitors. The uh, schematic symbol for capacitor is here. It looks like two lines, like two plates, um, and that actually represents sort of the structure inside the capacitor. There's no wires that short across the two terminals of a capacitor. They're used to store energy. And again, you see the C1, C standing for capacitor, 1, the reference designator, and uh, the value would be replaced with the word cap. Inductors. Inductors store energy in a slightly different manner. They store it in the form of a magnetic field. Uh, the value uh, for inductors is measured in Henry's. The equation that governs uh, the current and voltage and inductance of an inductor is given by the equation, the voltage equals the inductance times the change in current with respect to time. Now, what that means is, an inductor, if you just took a battery across it and wait some amount of time, it looks like a piece of wire, and you get lots of current to flow through it. But if you were to suddenly, after you've connected this inductor across the battery, if you were to suddenly disconnect it, the inductor, because of the, the way it's built, would want the current to keep flowing through it. And you can actually get a fairly large spark from one end of the inductor to the battery as it attempts to keep current flowing through it. A lot of the, the hand shockers and stun guns use inductors extensively in just this way. They switch the, the voltage up by using this principle. Um, inductors are often used to filter out what's called radio frequency interference. 
um, uh, lots of 802.11 radios and other uh, piece of, pieces of radio frequency equipment emit energy that sometimes you don't want your circuit to pick up, so you can use these to filter uh, inputs. Uh, inductors are used extensively in power supplies, typically to convert energy from one voltage to another efficiently. Transformers are a type of inductor. Uh, it's an inductor wound in a different way. I'll get that in a moment. Um, basically what inductors do is they couple energy from one side of it to the other. And you can see the diagram here. where We have two, let me get the point here, two terminals going in and two terminals going out. So you can uh, basically send energy across the transformer. And you say, well, why is this interesting? Well, you can use it to isolate signals. Um, there are times when you have circuits where there's a, a, an area where there's a, a very high potential voltage, a very high voltage on one side, and you want to protect the other side of the circuit from that, so you can use a transformer. Uh, a lot of times when you get hum, when you connect a PC to, uh, say, a sound card or an external sound device, you'll get a buzz or a hum that can sometimes couple through. They often use audio transformers to isolate that. Transformers are also used in uh, um, step-up voltage converters, and I won't get into the details of that, but uh, there's lots of resources you can look up for that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about active components. Transistors, sort of a very basic element of an uh, integrated circuit. Transistors basically act as a switch. And there's sort of two basic classes, and there's other types of transistors that we won't uh, get into here but uh, that are related to these, but there's two basic types. One is called bipolar, and one is called a metal oxide semiconductor transistor. Um, diodes are another type of active device. They basically act as a one-way gate. And in that class of diodes, they've, a number of physicists years ago found out that if you make a diode a certain way, you can get it to emit light, thus the uh, emergence of the light-emitting diode. And then integrated circuits, which are basically lots and lots of transistors on a, on a small piece of silicon. Okay, let's talk about transistors a little bit. Like I said, they're electronic switches. Two basic types, bipolar, and this will be a little bit uh, detailed here, but what bipolar transistors are, they're called, what's called a current-controlled current source. And what that means is you actually use flowing current to switch it on and off. Uh, there's two flavors, if you will, of transistors. There's NPN and PNP. And these refer to how the transistors are made and how they can be used in the circuit. Um, transistors have typically have three terminals, although some exotic types have more. They have what's called the emitter, the base, and the collector. Uh, the base is the input switch that uh, controls current from the emitter to the collect from the collector to the emitter. Um, the other type of basic transistor is what's called a MOS transistor, a metal oxide semiconductor. And what these are, these are voltage-controlled current sources. Um, the reason that MOS transistors are used extensively in integrated circuits is because they take very little energy to turn them on. Let me bring the pointer up here. If you think about when you build a large integrated circuit, you don't want to... <coughs> excuse me, a lot of, you, you, you want to minimize the amount of energy used in the circuit. Well, with a bipolar transistor, you actually have to push energy into the base to make the transistor turn on. With an MOS transistor, you simply need to present a voltage. Current doesn't, or very little current actually flows into the transistor to turn it on. So you can save a great deal of energy. That's why most, in fact, all ICs are made using uh, CMOS these days, most uh, highly uh, integrated circuits. There's two basic flavors, as there were for bipolar. There's P-channel and there's N-channel. And they have three terminals as well, and they just call them different things. There's the drain, the source, and the gate. The gate is the switch that turns it off, and the drain and the source are where the current flows when you switch it on and off. Diodes are, uh, actually diodes I believe were invented first, but uh, they're basically a one-way gate for electricity. Um, there's different flavors of them, three common types. One is just a standard diode, uh, another type was called a Schottky diode, and another type was called a Zener diode. Diodes have a plus and minus side indicating which way current will flow through them. Um, diodes can often be used to protect a circuit. Let's say, for example, you want to keep someone from plugging in uh, a circuit backwards where they, where they apply power. You would actually be able to use a diode to keep current flowing only one direction and thus protect the circuit. Um, let's see. Um, diodes have what's called a drop. They actually lose a little bit of energy when you push current through them. Uh, typically, it's 0 0.6 volts and above, depending on the style. And then there's actually a, a little bit more interesting type of diode, the light-emitting diode. When you put energy through it, it lights up. <coughs> These have a little bit more of a forward voltage drop, uh, but the good news today is they're available in all colors, including white, blue, red. The white is one of the, uh, the newer types invented. In fact, most PDAs uh, utilize white LEDs to backlight the screen. It's a very efficient light source. They're expensive, but the cost is dropping. Um, a lot of people uh, have, uh, have been producing uh, light-emitting diode flashlights. They're also very popular. 
Um, there's a lot of work going on in, in actually replacing incandescent bulbs with LEDs. And once the cost gets below a certain point, uh, light bulbs in your house will run for you know, tens and tens of years with a fraction of the, uh, the energy expended of an incandescent or even a fluorescent bulb. On, uh, on LEDs, they, the way you can tell the plus and minus side is there's typically a flat spot on the minus side, as you can see here in the, let's see, this one here. Okay, um, when you're taking apart a circuit to try to figure out how it works or, you know, for curiosity or other reasons, you often want to know what the different integrated circuits do. So it's often useful to be able to read the package, the numbers on the package to determine what it is. One of the first things I do is you look for the logo of the manufacturer. Um, typically, most manufacturers have a, a, a logo that's typically the first letter of their company. I'll show you a couple examples in a moment. And you can look for that on the package, and that will sort of give you a, a starting point of where to, to look to gather more information. And then there'll be a string of numbers. Um, typically, um, the first part of the numbers, let's see here, so, indicate the actual part number. Uh, and the rest of the numbers are typically production dates, you know, when it was built, maybe what batch it came from. And you can use this information to then go, you know, from the manufacturer's website once you've identified the logo. Um, you can then go and look the part number up. And here's an example from, let's see the pointer up here. This is actually a, a Toshiba part number for a, a, a logic, a buffer. And so Toshiba often uses the letters TC um, in their part number. So you can see the TC here, and that, that can give you a pointer. And then they have the part number here, and they often give the, the package type, uh, and this is actually an order and number. But in this number, the, typically the first part actually is the part number. Here's just a few examples of uh, some of the, the labels you'll see on the ICs stamped on it. And again, there's, you know, there's, there's hundreds of companies out there, even more now that uh, um, Taiwan and China are actually opening up foundries. So there's, there's lots and lots of different logos. But after a while, you'll get a feel for what these logos, what, what the letter logos uh, mean, which company they're referring to, and you'll be able to look it up yourself. Okay, cracking the case. Um, very often when you buy a piece of electronics that you want to hack or you have an old piece of equipment that you'd like to repurpose by hacking, you want to open up the enclosure without destroying it. Okay, well, how do you do this? Well, first is to have the right tools. I like to have lots and lots of small screwdrivers. Uh, very often these PDAs and laptops use tiny, tiny screwdrivers, both Phillips and Flathead. Um, the other thing that's important to, is to know how most enclosures are fastened together. Uh, they're typically fastened together with screws, very small screws. Uh, plastic snaps molded into the sides of the case are often very popular. Uh, glue is used, and in some cases, uh, double-sided tape is often used. Okay, well, hacking the case is, is sort of like surgery. You wouldn't want, well, for example, you wouldn't want your doctor to use a battle axe to perform an appendectomy. Get good tools. Um, I prefer hardened steel tools. Uh, one of the most frustrating things is to use an inexpensive uh, tool you bought for a dollar or two to have it only strip the heads of the screws, ruining the screw and your screwdriver. So I recommend that you get some really good tools. Um, a lot of the different cases, uh, the electronics cases, are, are held together with some sort of obscure type of screwdriver or screw. And Joe mentioned this before. There's lots of different ones uh, that are used out there. They call them security screws. And basically what they are is they're just sort of security through obscurity. Uh, most of the, these uh, security screwdrivers are available through most uh, Internet stores. But the common ones you'll find out there that are a little obscure are Torx drivers, which are star-headed screws. And they're, they're not so much a security reason, but they actually provide a, a way to provide more torque onto the screws. So you can crank it harder without stripping the, uh, uh, the screw head itself. Um, hex drivers are also popular with lots of uh, equipment. They have a hexagonal shaped head. And again, the reason is because you can apply, you can crank down the screws harder without stripping it. I like to have a good pair of uh, steel tweezers. And they're good for lots of different stuff, placing components. But also, if you drop a screw into a case, you can use it to fish the screw out from the bottom of the case. Uh, the flat end can also be used as a very good pry bar if you need to pop the case open. I carry a set of dental picks with me from time to time. These are very often uh, useful for opening up the seams on the side of a case uh, when you crack it. Uh, I carry uh, some razor blades as well. I prefer the X-Acto style. These are often very useful, again, for if you need to cut a small piece of plastic open, uh, pick open a small um, uh, cover that's placed over screws very often. Um, collecting good tools uh, can be an obsession. Uh, by having uh, the better tools, you can often uh, show off that uh, perhaps you're a little bit better than someone else. You know what you're doing. Uh, I love the, the latest German hardened steel stuff is also very, is good to have. So common fasteners, screws, plastic snaps, glue, double-sided tape. Uh, the Palm 5 was actually completely held together. The case was held together with double-sided tape. 
And the way you would open it up is either stick it in the oven or use a hair dryer for about five minutes and then the glue would soften and peel away. And that's how you put it back together again. Uh, a lot of people who upgraded memory or tried to replace their batteries, you know, spent days cracking the case, you know, pulling on it would bend the metal. Now, nah, just stick it in the oven for 20 minutes. <laughs> Screws are often placed in obscure places, um, not so much for security reasons, but to make the product cosmetically attractive. Um, they're often placed on the bottom of a product, uh, under labels, under the little feet of the product. Um, so it often pays to peel open those little round circles you see that look like they're uh, the same color as the plastic of the case, but maybe a little bit different texture. You'll often find a screw behind those. So good ways to open up a case. I'm going to switch over to a, a video here. I can show you some of the techniques I use. Clear a nice big tabletop. Um, the screws on the small electronics are actually very easy to lose. I often place sheets of white paper on the table first simply because the screws are more easy to see when you drop it on a piece of white paper. Um, obviously, uh, you want to power down whatever you're taking apart. You want to unplug it and or remove the batteries lest you get a, a shocking surprise. Um, the first step I take is you carefully remove all the screws you can find. Um, make sure you look under all the labels and feet. Um, one of the techniques I found, if you intend to put it back together again, is to take a piece of paper and sketch out a crude outline of the product and tape the screws to the relative location from which you put them. And that way you know where they're going to go when you put it back. If you'll excuse me for just a moment, I'll bring up a webcam and show you what I mean here. Picture is often worth a thousand words, so let's see if I can show you this. Okay, it's a little better. Uh, no, but uh, there was no uh, stand for it, so I had some black tape and I black taped it to the microphone stand, creating a hacked up camera stand for uh, just this purpose. Let's see here. Okay, so you get an idea here. So this is actually from a, a digital camera I took apart a little while ago. I drew just a crude outline of, of the camera itself and I started, sorry? Oh, it's not showing up? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah, okay. Oh well, I tried. Let's get back to this then. Well, you can come up afterwards and I'll show you what I mean. But basically, I took a sheet of white paper, I drew an outline of the product, and I started taping the screws as I took them out one by one. And that way, I knew exactly where they go. I sometimes number it as well so you know the steps. Um, these things can have 10, 20, 30 screws, and you know if you get even halfway through it, you forget where things go. Uh, da, da, da. Um, one of the things is once you pull all the screws out, the case still may be stuck together. Um, so what I do is you look for the seams, and the key phrase is you gently pull at them. Don't force it. If you force it, you're likely to break something. I use, uh, use uh, tweezers or a pick to open up the seams sometimes. Um, once you pull all the screws out that you found, there's probably one or two you didn't. And the way I generally uh, approach the problem is you pull at the two halves of the product, and feel for resistance. You know, if you see it from coming from one corner, you know there's either a screw there or a snap of some sort. And then you can go in with uh, more detail with either a pair of tweezers or the, your, your dental picks and push and pull until it's uh, released. Once you've released the electronics from inside an assembly, um, it's careful that you don't damage the actual circuit boards with static electricity. Now, there's a number of ways you can prevent this. Is one is you can use what's called a static wrist strap, which is basically a elasticized band that sits around your wrist uh, with a metal plate that touches uh, your skin somewhere, and then it runs a wire to a grounding point. And this grounding point is often just a three-prong plug assembly that plugs into the wall. Well, if you don't have one of those around and you want to be a little bit dangerous, what you can do is you can take a probably three, four-foot piece of wire. You can strip about eight inches from the end, and you can wrap it around your wrist. And you can take the other side, strip maybe three, four inches, and go to the wall plate and just pull the center screw out a little bit. That center screw, if the plug plate was wired to code, will be connected to actual neutral ground, which is, in theory, plugged into the ground of the earth. Screw it back in uh, such that the wire at that one end touches the wire, and you've got a nice hacked up wrist strap that'll keep you from damaging the circuit with static electricity. Do not, I repeat, do not plug the wire into any one of the three sockets. Uh, you might think that neutral plug on the third one is, is ground, and it typically is, but it's safer to use that uh, screw on the case, on, on the outside of the wall plate. Okay, building circuits. Well, there's a couple of skills involved that you need to build circuits. The first one would be if you want to build stuff that other people have designed, is how to read a schematic diagram. 
Um, another skill that's uh, often useful for quick prototyping is uh, what's called breadboarding. This allows you to quickly assemble circuits without actually soldering. It has some limitations, which we'll talk about. And the third is once you want to build a circuit that's semi-permanent or permanent, you uh, need to use solder to connect the different wires and ICs together. We'll touch, uh, touch on different types of irons, uh, bench style, portable, cordless. There's some great cordless soldering that's out there, out there that uh, are powered off of butane gas, don't require any plug-ins. We'll talk a little bit about solder, and we'll talk about the, another type of material called a perf board, which is a, another prototyping tool. And we'll talk about some of the tools you can use to, to uh, uh, work with these items. Okay, I hope this, you can see this up here. Yeah, okay. So this is a, a, a simple schematic diagram for a little pick-based project I worked on. Um, so let's walk through a couple items in the schematic diagram. So down here is typically what's called the title block, and this has the, typically the guy who designed it, his name, the project name, the revision number, when it was drawn. Around the outside, you'll see um, a set of numbers and letters, and what this allows you to do is um, call out coordinates of an object within the diagram if you want to find it. So along the top, I think there are numbers, along the side are letters. You can say A3 might be this area right here. So if you're communicating with someone else on a problem or a change to the circuit, they don't have a piece of paper in front of them, you can use these coordinates to tell them where to look. Let's look at a couple things in the circuit here, uh, the schematic diagram. Every part will have what's called a, a part reference. And here, on this integrated circuit, it says, a little hard to read, but U2. Uh, the letter U is uh, universally used to refer to any type of integrated circuit. And the number 2 means it's the, num the second integrated circuit that was probably placed when it was drawn. Uh, let's see, oops, where's the pointer again? Come on, oops. Okay. Um, along the sides of the IC will be the pins that actually provide connectivity to the outside world. Um, they have numbers and they have names inside the box that describes the IC. Um, one of the connections that you need to give to almost every IC is power. And you can see here, and you know, so I apologize for it's a little hard to read, um, but it indicates a voltage connected to this pin. It's a number, usually 3.3, 5, 1.2, 12, and a letter V for volts, and a line connecting it to the IC. This is the power supply. Typically, every package will also have a ground to allow the current to flow through it and back out again. Now, not every schematic will have grounds because some assume that uh, that the schematics are communicated within a company often in electronic form. So they often hide that ground connection. So you won't always find it on every schematic diagram you, um, you encounter. Uh, let's see, get the pointer back here. Where to go? There we go. Um, sometimes you'll see words or letters attached to wires just floating in space. These are what are called net names. And basically, if you see two of the same word on different wires, that means those two wires are connected. It just keeps the schematic diagram from getting clut cluttered. And obviously, lines that connect two points are indicate a wire. Um, a dot at a connection indicates that those three wires should be connected. Um, if there's two wires that cross without a dot, it means they should not be connected. So this is some basics on, on reading a diagram. These are different types of, uh, of gates. Uh, sometimes in the, in the name of the uh, integrated circuit, there'll be a letter A, B, C, D. What this indicates is uh, a part, it's one of the um, logic elements or uh, integrated circuit elements within one package. So for example, these all will have the same U7, I believe. I'm sorry, U, I'm sorry, U1, but they're labeled U1A, B, C, and D. Well, these are all in the same electronic package, but they have, uh, they're, they're independently connected. And here's an example of a diode, a transistor. These pieces, these blocks over here, typically will be connectors, and these allow you to get signals on and off the board. Okay, building circuits. Well, a quick and dirty way to, do, to build circuits is use what's called a breadboard. What breadboard is, is basically it's a piece of plastic with a bunch of holes in it, and underneath the holes are little um, metal trays that connect a series of these uh, uh, holes together. And what it allows you to do is take dip style or dual inline package. These are the integrated circuits that are large packages with big pins. You can plug them in directly and then use just solid core wire to make jumpers between connections. These holes will actually hold the wire in place. So within a few minutes, you can breadboard simple circuits. Now, it's not particularly useful for high frequency circuits, radios and so forth, but you can build microprocessor based stuff and, and simple audio circuits as long as they're not too high frequency. And the reason is because these wires are, are hanging out in space and when you get to high frequency circuits, those wires actually look like circuit elements and can um, uh, alter the way the circuit works. Um, these days, a lot of integrated circuits don't come in dip packages anymore, so breadboarding is, is not so popular anymore. Uh, there are a number of companies that make adapters, so you can take that big 
uh, flat part that has, you know, 150 pins around the edges, and you can actually convert it to some sort of package that has lots of pins that you can then use breadboarding. Well, if you want to make something a little bit more permanent, you're going to want to solder the, the elements together. Well, um, what do you need? Well, you need a soldering iron, you need solder, flux, and then it's not required, but uh, it's very helpful to have what's called uh, some sort of solder remover uh, um, uh, system. Soldering. Well, there's two basic types. There's electric and there's gas or butane irons. Electric irons obviously plug into the wall, and butane or gas-powered irons are like basically souped-up cigarette lighters. So here's a couple examples of these. These are very useful to have when you know you're not going to be near an electro power, electrical power outlet or where it's difficult to get the cord. You don't want the cord in the way. Um, lots of different types of solder. I'll touch on a few types. The most traditional type is a tin lead mix. Um, the lead gives it the low melting point. The tin gives it some electrical characteristics that are um, uh, desirable. It obviously has lead, so it's not being used as much these days. There's lead-free solder that uses other materials. Um, there's silver-based solder um, that some people use. Um, when you do solder, I often use what's called a tip cleaner. Um, when you solder, you'll get uh, solder blobs onto the end, end of the iron, and the iron will actually oxidize a little bit um, because it's so hot and has all these chemicals on it. So you can either use a sponge. You can take a kitchen sponge, cut it in half, put a little bit of water in it, and you can quickly wipe the, end, the tip on it. Or you can use a, a copper sponge, which is uh, basically a, a, a scrunched up copper, and you can dip the tip in that, and that will clean the, uh, the tip. Um, before you solder two things together, you can often you, you want to make the surfaces clean. And what you use that for is flux. It's a, a slightly acidic material that essentially cleans off any oils on the surface of the uh, two things you want to solder together. Um, lots of different types. There's the traditional rosin core, but there's a newer types. One's called water soluble. Basically, you can wash it away with, with deionized water. You don't want to use regular water to clean circuits because it has impurities and it can actually interfere with the circuit once you've uh, cleaned it. So if you use water soluble, water soluble and no clean are often used in conjunction. What no clean means basically is you can use the, the flux to clean the circuit when you're, uh, the surfaces before you saw them and you don't need to wipe it away when you're done. Uh, if you use a rosin core or acid-based solder, you need to use a flux remover, which is, comes in a spray can. Very often you'll make a mistake in the circuit. Um, you'll solder two things. You didn't mean to solder together, and you need to remove that solder. Well, there's two basic ways to do that. There's a material called solder wick, which is basically a braided uh, piece of copper that acts like a sponge. And what they have what's called a solder sucker. And what a solder sucker is a spring or electrically uh, a powered pump that, you, that uh, you cock, you put next to the two items in question that you wish to remove the solder, heat the joint, hit the button, and it sucks the solder away. Uh, solder wick can be more precision because you can place it at the exact point you want, you heat it, and again it acts like a sponge, uh, but solder suckers will often remove more solder in bulk. Okay, well, if you're soldering things together, you can't obviously use perf, uh, the uh, proto boards. Um, you need to use something called perf board. And what perf board is, basically, it's a blank uh, circuit board that you can solder to. It's made out of fiberglass, typically, and it will typically have uh, evenly spaced metal holes that are plated through on both sides. So you can insert your uh, components and then solder to the plated holes and uh, use wires to connect your different integrated circuits. It holds it in place and makes it a, a clean and, and even layout. Um, tools. Well, you typically want a set of wire strippers if you'll be connecting circuits together. Um, there's lots of different types out there, expensive, inexpensive. You'll need wire of some sort, various gauges, both stranded and solid core wire are useful to have around. And instead, uh, uh, wire cutters are useful as well. Um, wire strippers often include the cutters with them, but it's nice to have a small pair that's a little bit more precision to clip away uh, leads. You notice the resistors had two metal wires coming out the sides. Well, once you solder them to a circuit board, those wires are hanging out in space. You want to clip those away. And I like a set of needle nose pliers, again, to bend things around, to move them around once they've been soldered down. Okay, where to go to get parts? Um, I have a couple favorite places online that I go to. A uh, place, a company called DigiKey. Um, there's the website. They have tens of thousands of different different components, most available for shipment within, you know, 24 hours. Another company I like to use is Mouser. They also have a, a large stock of products. Uh, a slightly smaller company called Jameco. They have a large stock of electronic components. Um, a little bit more on the surplus side is a company called American Science and Surplus. They often sell not just components, but they'll sell, you know, uh, the circuit board from an old toy that didn't make it uh, or an old uh, video camera components. So they're kind of fun to pick up pieces that you can use to, uh, to hack yourself. And then um, there's a company called Halted. Uh, they have a website called uh, HSA. They also have a, um, 
a uh, real-world store in Santa Clara, California, and it's almost like a museum. They've got computer equipment, circuit boards, back to probably the 70s. They, uh, they buy out surplus equipment from companies that are either going out of business or want to liquidate inventory. So it's actually a great place just to sort of wander around. Uh, in California, in parts, I think out here, they have a, a, a big store called Fry's. Uh, they actually carry electronic components. Although it's shrinking, they still have a pretty good selection of parts. And of course, Radio Shack, you know, we all know about Radio Shack and the quality of their stuff, but they're everywhere and uh, they can often be used to do the job. We'll do a couple project walkthroughs. Um, a little while ago, I hacked up a toaster. Um, a little while ago, uh, several years ago, there was a, a little buzz about in the UK about a, a design student who put together a weather toaster and basically would toast a picture of a cloud of the sunshine on a piece of bread. And he got a lot of press for it. It was pretty complicated, all kinds of motors and gears, and there was a little, uh, it was a Java-based system, so it would go out and grab weather from some website. Well, I thought this was kind of complicated, and there might be an easier way to do it. So I made sort of design trade-offs, and I hacked something together in a weekend. And basically what I did is I opened up the toaster, and I clipped the toasting elements inside it. This is an example here of one of the sort of toasting walls inside your toaster. If you look inside when it's going, you'll see these wires glow red hot. Well, this is a, a, an example of, of how they're wired inside your toaster. So what I did is I cut it such that you would either be able to switch on the top elements or the bottom elements. And I used a, a high voltage relay so it could uh, switch the, the wall currents through it and rewired it slightly so that you would either select the top or the bottom to toast onto. And I put a switch and then I also put a, a computer controlled relay uh, to control it so you could actually toast two different patterns. And um, the other part of the trick was I created what's called a toast mask. And what this toast mask would do is it would sit in front of the toasting elements here and prevent the bread from being toasted along the lines of whatever your mask looked like. So you'd have a piece of bread with the, that would be mostly brown with the word hot or cool toasted onto it. Uh, and then you basically use uh, wires that you hold on the inside of the toaster. This is in my book, so this is some more details about this. But this was, a, this was sort of a fun hack I put together. Uh, I've also been reading about overclocking and the use of um, uh, these solid state coolers. They're called Peltier junctions. And I thought, wow, that's a little miniature solid state refrigerator. What could you do with that? Well, I did a little more searching and I found a, a website of a, a German fellow or a Danish fellow who had put together a beer glass that ran with one of these. And he basically sort of mounted it on the bottom and didn't make real good contact with the glass. And I thought there's a better way to do this. So what I did is I had one of these extra cooling uh, systems available. Uh, and I knew that metal conducted heat a lot better than glass did. So I mounted the uh, cooler to the bottom of a um, pewter beer stein. And I created the self-chilling beer mug. And here's how it's connected. So you've got your, your oops. Your beer mug here. Mounted to the bottom of the beer mug is a, uh, a layer of thermally conductive grease or thermally conductive adhesive. There's a heat pipe, which is basically a block of metal. And then there's what's called the Peltier Junction Cooler, which is the, the device that, it's actually a heat pump. It moves heat from one side to the other, or cool from one side to the other. So you stack these up. This device is connected to the block, which is glued to the bottom of the, of the, uh, the mug. And then there's a heat sink to pull the, basically the bottom of the Peltier Junction gets hot and the top gets cool. So you put a heat sink on this because you've got to remove the heat some way or else it won't work. And then a fan on the bottom. And the whole thing is powered from a 12 volt cigarette lighter adapter or a, an old PC power supply. And you can come up and look at it afterwards, but, but here it is. It'll keep your beer very cold. And if you're in your car, it'll keep your beer car, your beer cool and you're driving along. <laughs> or other beverages. So here's some other views of it. You can see the, the large fan on the bottom. I just used an extra PC fan I had. And you can see that it's completely metal on the inside. And again, this was to allow it to get the maximum cooling capacity for the mug. Um, a little while ago, I had an extra flashlight. And someone asked me if I could convert it to use an LED instead of an incandescent bulb. And I said, sure you can. It's a real quick, easy hack. And basically, you replace the bulb. What I did is I took the bulb out of the flashlight. I um, covered the, the last part of the bulb with a, with a towel and took a pair of pliers and crushed the glass and then used some dental picks and, and needle nose pliers and I removed all the glass, hollowed it out and you can see here's the, you can see here's the bottom of the, uh, the light bulb. And then I simply added uh, an ultra bright white LED in series with a resistor and I wired it into uh, the metal parts of the can here and you can see the resistors here. I actually did a cluster to get a little bit brighter. I then mounted the whole system back into the flashlight bulb holder so I wouldn't have to modify any more of the flashlight itself and oops, and voila. You have a flashlight that's conver been converted. How wide is it? One and a uh, this is an actually a 4.5 volt flashlight. For this hack, I actually used a three cell flashlight to make it bright. Um, there's some, been some articles published recently. There's a couple websites. 
to, to use a two-cell or one-cell flashlight, you have to use what's called a DC-DC converter. And the reason is, is because the LEDs need a certain threshold voltage to turn on, and it, that threshold voltage is about 1.7 to 2 volts. Um, so that's why uh, a lot of people use um, uh, multi-cell flashlights this or a DC-DC converter. But this is just a quick and dirty hack. So again, this is about as bright as the bulb was before. It's not as directional because the uh, flashlight reflector was not designed to use LEDs. It was designed to use an incandescent bulb. But it was quick and dirty hack, and there's obviously more room for me to play with this. Let's see. Uh, so we'll quickly, the last project to walk through is the, the Blinken Lights project. And I just thought this was fun and interesting. It, it sort of captured my uh, imagination. Um, it basically, they, a group of hackers took an eight-story building and turned it into a giant display. Um, they did it over a couple of weekends. They used about 5,000 meters of Cat5 cable to wire every single light in the front of the building. Um, there's basically a halogen lamp in front of, an individually controlled halogen lamp in front of each window. The whole system was controlled by a Linux PC with a 192-channel parallel I.O. card. So here's sort of their basic setup. They had a sort of a master computer down here, and they ran cable to every single one of these lights to a little relay, and the relay would switch on or off one of these halogen lamps. So a lot, lots and lots of wiring went into this project. And you can see some of the pieces here. They used these, uh, these, these uh, wooden trees to hold the lamps in place. Here's a, they had to use relay amplifier drivers because the, the Cat5 wire dropped too much uh, voltage across that length. Here's the PC that ran it. Here's the, uh, the rat's nest of wires. Um, here's another example. You can see the lights sitting in front of each of the windows. So I'd like to establish or I'd like to inspire a renaissance in hacking. Hardware hacking is actually pretty easy and it's a lot of fun. It's actually really akin to recycling. You take old equipment that maybe doesn't have a use anymore and you give it, uh, give it new life. You can learn a lot while you're doing it. I find the process of deconstruction to be highly educational. Um, but be careful when you do. Make sure stuff's unplugged. Um, high voltages are bad for your heart. So go home and hack something today. Thank you. <laughs>